coming today to the panel discussion on changing the moral climate on climate change. My name is Susanna Barsom, and I am the Associate Director of the Penn State Center for Sustainability, and I'll be moderating the discussion tonight. Uh, tonight's panel has been organized by Peter Buckland and Don Brown, run away, <laughs> and is sponsored by the organizations listed <coughs> here on the screen. Uh, special thanks, though, go to the Department of Science, Technology, and Society for their funding of tonight's event. <laughs> Climate disinformation has been go ongoing, but recent attacks in the media in Pennsylvania are of particular concern because they call for the silencing of voices that are reporting the results of scientific investigations. For a university that values truth, academic integrity, and social and personal responsibility, and encourages respect for the dignity of all individuals within the Penn State community, this has become personal. Our five panelists tonight come from different disciplinary backgrounds and have different stories to tell. I'll introduce them to you first, let them discuss their views of the ethics of the public discourse on climate change, and afterward we'll take some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, you have some sheets, if you got one on the way in, where you can write your questions and we'll be collecting them. Um, the volunteers will be coming down the aisles to collect those. So, tonight's panel. Donald Brown will be our first speaker. Want to wait for some? Don's right here. Don was the environmental program manager for UN organizations at the Environmental Protection Agency under the Clinton administration. He was a Pennsylvania Assistant Attorney General uh, and Environmental Litigator in the Rendell Administration here in Pennsylvania. He's currently a faculty member in the Department of Science, Technology, and Society, and he's the lead blogger on the website climateethics.org. Check it out. <laughs> Peter Buckland is a PhD candidate in Educational Theory and Policy. He's the co-founder and co-host of the Sustainability Now radio program. And Peter is the recipient of the first Student Sustainability Leadership Award, a co-recipient, I should say. And uh, this is a brand new award this year, and uh, competition was fierce. And Peter now has a tulip tree planted in his honor on this campus. So that, it's, a, it's a really great award. <laughs> Janet Swim. As a faculty member in the Department of Psychology, uh, Dr. Swim studies how people understand and respond to climate change, and she teaches a course on sustainability that addresses this topic in some detail. She has served as head of the American Psychology Association's Task Force on the Psychology of Climate Change, and she's one of the foremost researchers on environmental psychology in the country. Richard Schumann. Rick is the uh, Walter L. Robb Director of Engineering Leadership Development, and he is a faculty member in the School of Engineering, Design, Technology, and Professional Programs, and an affiliate of the Department of Science, Technology, and Society. Um, he has presented scholarly papers on ethics and the politics of climate change, and he teaches a course in engineering leadership that uses climate change as a focus for discussions on judgment. Michael Mann. Is a professor of meteorology and director of the Earth Systems Science Center at PSU. I guess you can tell which one he is because he's the only one who hasn't been called on yet. Um, professor Mann was a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. If you're not familiar with that term, you'll hear it again and again tonight. So IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the team of scientists that was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. He's the author in 2008 of Dire Predictions, Understanding Global Warming, The Illustrated Guide to the Findings of the IPCC, and just this year, The Hockey Stick in Climate Wars, a book recounting his experiences with the science and politics of climate change. And hot off the press, brand new news, um, Dr. Mann has just been awarded the Hans Eschger Medal Oschger Medal, sorry, my German's not so great, of the European Geophysical Union. So congratulations. Okay. So I am so delighted to be with you all. Peter is the heavy lifter in this crowd. Thank you, Peter. 
Uh, I'm delighted to be with you. I'm particularly honored to be with you, Michael. Uh, if there is a historically important story to be told tonight, Michael is the epicenter of that story. So I am honored, honored to be on the same panel uh, with you. So, um, we will be talking about what, not only climate change, but whether higher education is doing a good job of educating people about climate change. That's the subtext of this. I will be talking about um, one um, part of that, which is the climate change disinformation campaign. Um, this is not the only issue that should raise questions about whether higher education is educating people about. I think higher education is not only educating uh, people about climate change, but, but educating people about the interdisciplinary aspects of the problem. Anyway, let me jump into the, the disinformation campaign. That's what I, I'm going to talk about. Let me start by saying skepticism in science is a good thing. We should encourage it. Skepticism is not bad. Um, but skeptics should play by the rules of science, okay? So what we're gonna do, what I'm gonna do is distinguish skepticism, even skepticism about climate change, which we should encourage from disinformation, which is a completely different animal. Um, there is a 35-year debate, a rich history, a text. Uh, historians can look at what happened. Um, social scientists have now really turned to it in a very big way. Um, this, this debate has had different parties in the debate. It's included mostly fossil fuel companies, um, some corporations, not all corporations, not all fossil fuel companies, um, and they have, the other players are environmental groups. Environmental groups sometimes exaggerate about possible impacts of climate change. But this fight has been between these people and the mainstream scientific organizations. I've never seen an environmental problem like this. This is not a fight between the hyperbolic claims of the environmental community uh, versus the industry. This is a fight between these guys and the most prestigious scientific organizations in the world. It's really interestingly different. Um, and so, uh, there's something called a consensus position. The uh, a consensus position is not the consensus about everything. The U.S. Academy of Sciences, the most prestigious scientific organization in the United States, has issued reports five times, first time in 1978, saying the consensus position is right with higher and higher levels of certainty. The most recent U.S. Academy of Science report was last year, in May of last year. And the consensus position has certain elements. It's not a consensus about everything. It's a consensus that the planet is warming, that it's mostly human cause, that we're probably in trouble, serious, harsh trouble, if we don't change uh, business as usual. And the, prob the probability that this is not true is less than 5%, five, five okay? Um, and there, there's some uncertainty about what's called climate sensitivity, but even at the lower end of climate sensitivity, there are parts of the world that get hurt really badly by two degrees centigrade rise uh, of climate sensitivity. So that's the consensus position. That consensus position has been supported by every academy of science in the world that has taken a position. There are 19 of them. It has been supported by every scientific organization, I believe there's at least 120 of them, that have, that have relevant scientific expertise. Okay, I notice I didn't say it's a consensus about everything, but the consensus position has been supported by all the mainstream scientific organizations. Now there's a huge social science literature about this thick 35 year history of climate change disinformation. I just put these up there. These are sociological peer reviewed papers that I'm relying upon most heavily. There are over 30 of them, there are eight or nine books. Michael's book is the most recent one in this. And they describe, they all agree about what I'm going to talk about. It's called the disinformation campaign. Um, and so, this literature uh, all agrees that the disinformation campaign, campaign actually got started before climate change was really an issue. It started at the end of the 60s as mostly uh, right-wing conservative think tanks, which are at the center of a lot of this, as I will explain, 
uh, started to be a counter movement to some of the things that were happening in the United States in the 1960s. So the sociologists call this a counter movement uh, in response to other things that are happening in the culture. The climate change part of this was actually grafted on strategies developed by some industries. They started with the, 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 uh, a lot of it, the tactics were honed in fights about tobacco companies. Now, this is a chart from the two sociologists, uh, Dunlap and McCreef, that describes this thing called the climate change disinformation campaign. It's not, there's no one in charge of this campaign. It's a, it's, a, it's a movement where they all talk to each other. Okay, so they describe um, the, the fossil fuel industry originally were the largest funders. Most recently, the funders have been right-wing philanthropic organizations that have been doing most of the funding recently. Other industries, uh, uh, lobbying groups have been funding this up there in that right-hand corner, uh, corporations, um, conservative foundations, right-wing right -wing free market philanthropic organizations have been funding this campaign. It has certain kinds of organizations in this, this, in this according to the sociological papers, which they all agree on, it has think tanks, front groups, and something called astroturf groups, and I'm gonna explain a little bit more of that. The literature also describes tactics that, that, the, that have, have been at the center of how this campaign has unfolded. And I'm gonna talk about each of the tactics very, very briefly. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you that this is not responsible skepticism. Scott's responsible skepticism is a good thing that we need to encourage, even about climate change, because everything is not completely known about, about, about climate change. So one tactic that you will see these organizations call is they've been spreading lies about the science, not skepticism. They, they're making claims that the entire uh, basis of the science is a complete hoax. How could it be a hoax when every academy of science in the world supports the position? Every scientific organization with expertise supports the consensus position. How could it be a hoax? Uh, it is just inconceivable. That's not reasonable skepticism. That's either lying or, or a reckless disregard for the proof. You'll see them saying that there's no evidence of human causation. There's 15 different independent lines of human causation. There are, there are things called uh, fingerprint studies. Uh, the models only work if there's human forcing. We know that the carbon dioxide is fossil carbon. And on and on, there are different, 15 different lines of human causation. But they're out there saying there's no evidence of human causation. That is not reasonable skepticism. That is not responsible skepticism. It's, it's not peer reviewed. It's not claimed by the rules of science. It's in fact a claim which, which has not been supported by the rules of science. Another tactic that you'll see them doing all the time is called cherry picking. This is probably the most common tactic. They'll take it, which is something that's complete, which is not known in the science. We don't really know how clouds will respond in a warming world, what their altitude will be, and that will depend, that will determine whether there's positive or negative forcing from the clouds. But they will sound the cloud data that it says that it undermines all the, the thousands of other lines of evidence as undermining all the science. And because we don't know about clouds, uh, we can't say anything about, about climate science. It's called cherry picking uh, the science. Uh, they'll pick one paper in a series of papers which disagrees with 15 other papers and say that because one paper disagrees that all the rest of it may in fact be wrong. So a fairly common tactic is cherry picking. Another thing that they claim, they're, they, the, the, I'm going to talk about the public relations firms that have field tested some of their tactics. They claim that if you don't prove everything, it's bad science. If you don't prove everything with 95% confidence levels, it is in fact bad science. Well, IPCC only claims to prove some things by the balance of the evidence, or the preponderance of the evidence. Climate system is so incredibly complicated that if you wait till everything is completely proved, you can't say anything about it. We, we've known, I believe, for 35 years enough to take action uh, because we're hurting other people by our non-action. 
they're getting away because universities are not teaching people about what are called epistemic norms in science. Science doesn't always depend upon 95% confidence levels. Doctors rarely use on complete, complete proof, but they're getting away with it because universities are not teaching uh, what I call epistemic norms of science. Um, so they're saying, they're calling things bad science, which, which the public relations firms field tested with focus groups, because they know it would work if you call it bad science, and they know people don't know what bad science really is, and they're, get, and they're getting away with it. Um, they're also manufacturing fake science. Okay, now how do they do this? Some of the think tanks which I will be talking about hold conferences which, um, uh, which they invite 97 deniers, many of whom are, have uh, relationships with these, with these think tanks, um, and then the, 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 their scientific presentation is not peer reviewed. Okay, it is, uh, they invite people to talk about the science, that make claims that are not peer reviewed, and then they publish the, 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 peer, the proceedings of the conferences as if they're entitled to respect, but they haven't gone, they haven't played by the rules of science. Science expects uh, falsifications to be tested but by peer reviewed or, and to be tested by institutions that have multidisciplinary expertise that know all the literature. So they're consistently creating, um, creating uh, disinformation about the, si about the science. Um, and then they circulate the results to journalists who don't have a clue about any of this. And the universities are doing a really bad job, in my view, of educating people about this. And so this is a democracy problem. At its core, it's a democracy problem because it's, it's, it's public, it, it, is, it is propaganda, very, very sophisticated propaganda. Uh, not, there are several kinds of organizations that are in fact doing this. There are think tanks. The think tanks are all tied to conservative, right-wing conservative money. Um, and they hold conferences, they publish books. Um, what's so amazing about what they do is that they, they, well, usually 10% of their budget is for communication to journalists and legislators. So they know how to get the word out. And they're making claims that their fake conferences and their fake lists represent the peer-reviewed science, and it doesn't at all represent peer-reviewed science, peer science. But they're getting away with it, and I believe higher education is in fact part of the problem. The conservative think tanks have ties to friendly legislators in many cases. The legislators then bring the think tank people in to testify uh, uh, at, at legislative hearings, and so it's a remarkable, uh, a, a remarkable operation. There's something called front groups. Uh, uh, corporations know that they cannot, that public people will, will suspect um, uh, the evidence, scientific evidence from coming back, so they create, they create, they create uh, organizations with nice sounding names such as the Global Client Information Project, it sounds neutral, it's all funded by, by, by people with economic interests, uh, the Global Council on the Environment, um, and the very purpose of these institutions is to hide the real party in interest. They're trying to hide who's funding all of this stuff, okay? And they're getting away with it because people don't understand. The sociologists now understand how, it, how it's all funded and, and how it worked. Um, and so, that's another tactic. The, 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 front, the front groups also have been supporting financially. And by the way, you can track all the money back for both the front groups to either corporations or, or, or free market fundamentalist uh, foundations. So, so they, they, they support denier websites and they all talk to each other uh, and spread every false rumor about the climate science. My dear friend Michael has been seeing this too many times. Um, and there's something called astroturf groups. If, okay, an astroturf group is a fake, a fake grassroots organization. Climate change denial system is full of these organizations, where they've been created to, to give the pretension that this is a, a spontaneous bottom-up movement. Um, the, the astroturf groups are often funded by the front groups or by the think tanks, 
uh, who were in turn funded by, by, the, corp by, by the corporations, and they're, they're given, their, their very existence is to fool people about these people appearing at public hearings are just ordinary grassroots organizations. But yet we know that they're using sophisticated computer databases and telephone to get people to, uh, to come out to, to public hearings, and it's funded, it's funded often, unfortunately, by, by, by fossil fuel companies. Um, the, one of the most troubling things is the use of public relations firms. The public relations firms have been hired, uh, in many cases, by industry fossil fuel organizations, and they've done such things as target uneducated white males in the United States, which, the, which their PR research knows will work, um, that they're, they're good targets to get. They, they've hired public relations firms with the express message of undermining the science of, of, of climate change. The contracts which are now available shows that fossil fuel companies has hired a public relations firm and gave them a contract to undermine the science of climate change. That is not reasonable skepticism. That is propaganda. That is disinformation. That is not reasonable skepticism. Um, uh, there, there's usually collision, collusion between the, the front groups and the astroturf groups. Another tactic they're using all the time is making bogus economic claims, okay? Uh, I have my, and by the way, I teach my students to, 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 to don't trust me to draw their own conclusions about the science of climate change, uh, which is uh, something that we actually should talk about. How do we talk about when we teach this stuff? But um, if you follow climate arguments, which are now 35 years old, this has been going on, 35 years old, Almost all the arguments are two types. One, there's no scientific basis for doing anything about climate change, but even probably the more frequent argument, this will destroy the economy of the United States, okay? Uh, this will destroy jobs, okay? There are so many problems with the economic arguments, I could have given this whole lecture on ethical and moral problems with the economic arguments, but universities are teaching people the analytic skills to unpack the economic arguments. One of the problems is, if climate change is a moral problem, we not only have economic interests, yes, we have economic interests, but we have duties and responsibilities and obligations to the people that we're hurting around the world. Okay, we, if, if the consensus view is correct, let, no, let there be no doubt that the United States, for 25 years, has failed, has, has prevented the international community from doing anything about this. This disinformation, uh, if, if the consensus view is correct, the disinformation campaign has, we've lost 25 years because of this, of this disinformation campaign. Um, there are many, many problems with the economic arguments and a, a, a very well-educated student should, should be taught to, to, to unpack ethical problems with these arguments. And probably the most troubling tactic of all, if this is reasonable skepticism, I don't understand anything. So what they're doing is they're cyberbullying both journalists and scientists. Okay, so there's a website which, at least two years ago, was traceable to ExxonMobil funding. Okay, so if you appear, if Michael appears or I appear nationally, they put my picture and my personal email, and within 48 hours you get hundreds of really nasty, some of them are up here, death threats, um, hate mail, not responding at all to your saying, not inviting, a, 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 you know, intellectual engagement. It's pure and pure out-and-out -out intimidation. Okay, uh, the, the, the Guardian in the UK has been doing a wonderful job of, of tracking all this. The US press is really still falling down, although Michael's book may. Uh, this is some of the stuff that is that, that I have gotten death threats, Okay, it's really nasty, it's pure intimidation. This is not responsible skepticism. Okay. <laughs> and, okay. Um, <laughs> so, these are the tactics. The sociological, the sociological literature degrees. Okay, I'm finished. Um, let me just say that, unfortunately, there are consequences We've lost 25 years, okay? Um,
this is not disinformation. I think we should encourage a conversation whether this is some kind of new crime against humanity. It is really evil stuff. It is nasty. It has profound consequences for people in Africa, small island developing states. And the US, virtually standing alone, has failed to act on climate change. And this, this, this is why, I think. So thank you. Um. Hey, thank you so much, Don. Uh, I'll just say really briefly, uh, Don called me uh, right around the time that uh, Michael did his president's forum, or the Penn State forum, when he was attacked by this, an AstroTurf campaign, uh, and was just appalled, and said, will you help me get this panel together? And I said, yeah, sure, sounds great. Um, so my name is Peter Buckland, and I like to pace, I'm a big pacer. Uh, and hopefully this thing doesn't malfunction. If it does, I'll end up standing back over there. Uh, I, I started my graduate program in large part because I realized that the climate change disinformation campaign, the climate change skeptics, the deniers, however you want to characterize it, that they were making their way into education. And I already saw that they were doing it through uh, sec primary and secondary education uh, by hitching onto the backs of creationists in the United States. And it started successfully the first time in Louisiana. Uh, and that was in, I believe, 2008. And so I've had this abiding interest in, the, in this controversy. And, and I knew that it was going to make its way into uh, higher education as well. And so when Michael was attacked on local radio and Don called me, I went, yeah, I'm there. right? So, uh, Derek Bach is the, was the former president of Harvard University, and he said, the university is the central institution of the post-industrial society. And that's kind of easy to believe if you've graduated Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, George W. Bush, and uh, Al Gore, right? I mean, big heavy hitters, right, in our American politics. But there's no doubt that today's life our lives today is touched by the modern research university. You can't really look around uh, the developed nations of the world and say, oh, universities have nothing to do with that. No. Uh, as we all know, the leaders, the political, corporate uh, leaders of our world uh, go through college, and many of them go to research universities like Harvard and like Penn State. So why do people go to college, right? I mean, what's the, what's the big deal, right? Well, people go you know, to learn about themselves. There's this existentialist. I'm going to find myself when I go to college, man. It's, it's going to be cool. I'm going to hang out with people, and I'm going to learn something. And maybe you find out that you're just a thinking robot. Uh, you're self-aware. Maybe you learn about happiness, and you think, OK, well, now I have something about the key to happiness. Or you're like the little Tarsier over here, and you go, oh, my god. Right? This little guy over here. <laughs> but if you ask most students why they go, oh, ah, why they go to college, they will tell you, and so will their parents stop it. Why uh, Go to. Uh, well, it's not going to do it. Go to. Uh, it's it's for jobs, right? It's it's an economic reason. Uh, people want a secure job, or they want to make more money. Right? People go back to school so that they can have more security. Rick is here helping me. Uh, right? But then also, eh, it's all right. You can just stay on this one. Oh, there you go. See, Jerry Maguire. Right? Show me the money. OK, but society, our society, invests in higher education to a large degree because we want responsible citizens to come out at the, that pipeline right at the end. Right, what gets blocked out? Yay, a good citizen. That's what, that's what we hope happens. They are aware of their cultural heritage, we hope, right? Of course, we can all have arguments about they're not really learning about their cultural heritage, but we hope that they do. That's one of the reasons that, that we send them. Uh, we hope that they become voters and that they become responsible voters, that they learn to use their voices to lead others. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about leadership in just a couple minutes. And that they know how to participate in a democracy. That they are respectful people, that they learn how to get along, that they become good at participating in what the philosopher John Dewey called a mode of associated living. 
right? So I have to live with you, I have to share decisions with you, I need to respect you and share power with you. Well, given what Don has just talked about with the climate change disinformation campaign, you can imagine that this might be a little bit challenging. This last purpose gets maybe a little difficult. The Carnegie Foundation did a, they published a book a few years ago, and what they did is they went through about 100 years worth of statements on the purposes of the quote unquote liberal education, the general education that people get when they go to a college or university. And so these are some of those purposes, right? An enhanced global perspective, uh, preserving a democratic society, integrating diverse groups of people, overcoming anti-democratic behavior, and Don has just talked about. Avoidance of unethical and immoral behavior, reducing asocial behavior, live life for today attitude. So this came from a, a calling through lots and lots and lots, hundreds of statements on the purposes of education. There were about 50, but these all have to do with democratic process. And so when you think about what Don just talked about, that makes that runs, that's a collision course between universities, university purposes in a civil society, and the climate change disinformation campaign. And as we know, and Don just showed us, they're not the only players in town, right? The economic imperative of colleges and universities feeds directly into the other institutions of the world as well. You gotta be kidding me if you think that ExxonMobil isn't you know, armed to the teeth with college graduates. The American Enterprise Institute. There aren't very many high school dropouts at the AEI. <laughs> Fox News, right? Fox News, you can watch Fox News all over campus here if you, if you want to. There are seven studies that show that if you watch Fox News, you are much more likely to believe factually wrong things than if you watch any of the other ones, right? CNN, I'm no CNN fan. You are likely to be factually much more informed if you watch CNN, right? And then NPR and PBS higher. So, and over here, right, we have the Koch brothers right here who are running rampant doing whatever they want because they give 20 or $40 million to attack whatever they feel like. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway call these people the merchants of doubt. So the people, it's a great book, I, I really encourage you to read it. The people who Don was just talking about, they're the merchants of doubt. And so how can a university really respond to this? Well, some of the ways that it's ha happening is that you have these big groups of universities getting together and saying, hey, we need a sustainable future, or climate change is a problem. And so I have a list of international groups up here that include uh, the University Leaders for a Sustainable Future. Uh, you also have uh, higher education institutions who may be involved with the United Nations Decade of Education for Sustainable Development, right? So that's, that's one way, and so they're recognizing that there are a lot of problems in the world, okay? And climate change is among those problems. In the United States, we have groups like the American Association for Sustainability in Higher Education, AISHI, here on the left. I'm, I'm probably gonna start using acronyms, I'm sorry. Um, but to speed it up a little bit. And Penn State is a member of AISHI, has contributed to AISHI. I've been to an AISHI conference with a couple of people in the room. There's also the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, which I will from now on call the ACUPCC. Because <laughs> right? that's so much easier. But the ACUPCC, I think, it is, is different from ACE. And, and I'll say right now, Penn State is not a member of the ACUPCC. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a couple of minutes. But all of these groups say, okay, we need to have sustainability, and embedded in there somehow is, is a response to climate change, and for some of them, very directly. There are also regional and state-level organizations that say, hey, this, we need to change this. This is different, like, we have to do this differently. And one of them is Pennsylvania Environmental Resource Consortium in the middle, and they uh, help sponsor our event tonight, but there are some in the Midwest, there's the New Jersey version, there's one in Maine, there are different state versions. And then finally, there are also 
student versions of this. So students go, wow, climate change is really terrible and we, we have to do something about it. Um, so they get together and, and have things. And, and this also happens at universities. And so a few years ago at Penn State, we had the Student Sustainability Summit. So uh, universities are responding. But I agree with Don that maybe they could be doing something a little better. So here's the text that opens the American College and University President's climate commitment. We, the undersigned presidents and chancellors of colleges and universities, are deeply concerned about the unprecedented scale and speed of global warming and its potential for large-scale adverse health, social, economic, and ecological effects. We recognize the scientific consensus that global warming is real and is largely being caused by humans. Okay, that's pretty clear. I would call that a fairly firm rebuttal to a climate change disinformation campaign from the administration of a university, right? It says, no, there is a scientific consensus and it's causing problems and we have to do something about it. That's great. Now, how successful they are, that's, that's a whole other, that's a series of talks. And, uh, but Penn State has a sustainability strategic plan, and, and I was on the metrics team for this. Uh, and so I'm gonna be a little critical of this, having been involved with it, and having asked to be involved with it, and being like, hey, we need to, and going, uh, okay, so you don't win everything. But I think that there's room for, for growth. Uh, and so I'm gonna say a few things uh, about this. Okay, so they have a definition of sustainability, which is good. Okay, a vision, so, and it focuses on literacy, solutions, and leadership. Awesome, leadership. That's something that we need badly. Okay, comprehensive integration of sustainability into the university's research, teaching, and service will prepare students, faculty, and staff to be sustainability leaders. Yes, right? And, then, and so this is, I think, is starting to get at what Don was, is, is hoping for. And that's a, that is necessarily an interdisciplinary and across the whole university enterprise. Okay? Now, Penn State monitors its greenhouse gases and there are emissions goals. You can talk to people at the Office of Physical Plant uh, uh, about this. You can look at, uh, there's a dashboard online. You can go, oh, all right, you know, progress. Right? We've added lots of thousands of square feet of footage, but electricity consumption has gone down. Pretty amazing. Uh, Hen Foley in the Sustainability at Penn State video, you can watch it online if you want to. He says problem number one, or first problem we face is carbon. Okay, so that's good. This is not an official document. Okay. <laughs> so, calling through the sustainability strategic plan and other places, and I called a couple of people and said, hey, is there really no climate action plan for Penn State? Am I wrong? Um, I'm not. There is no climate action plan. Nothing formal. There is nothing akin to the ACU PCC signatory that says, from the highest level of the university that says, climate change is real, there is a scientific consensus, and we are going to act on it accordingly. There is sustainability, which is awesome, but climate change is not in there. You do not see global warming, greenhouse gas, et cetera, in there. And I did, I did control F and like went through a whole bunch of times, right, to, just to make sure that I wasn't wrong. And I guess I could still be wrong, but my eyeballs are terrible then. Um, and, and I just want to note, in addition to the people who we have here, we have all these other people at Penn State um, and th this is not exhaustive. Richard Alley is at the top left. Dr. Petra Chuckert, uh, Dr. Bill Easterling, Raymond Najjar, um, Brent Yarnall, uh, Dr. Nancy Tuwana, who all do things on climate change here. And there's not this climate action plan. Brent Yarnall has written a thing about climate action plans for communities, and Penn State doesn't have one. I want there to be one. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so where is it? Penn State responded to the women's movement, the civil rights movement. Maybe we, I mean, we still have work to do on these things. It's responding to the sustainability movement. 
But in a really kind of sad note, and I hate to leave on a bummer, although I'm very good at doing that because I talk about the environment all the time, is that, that um, I'm glad you laughed, that's wonderful, thank you. Um, is that Penn State has cut the science, technology, and society department which is an interdisciplinary department that was great for having the conversation and the educational nexus for students and for all of us to talk about the dilemma that climate change faces with us. That was probably the best place for it to happen. In a way, tonight is part of its last hurrah. They paid for this to be here tonight. So, I, I thank them a lot. So, I'm just gonna let this sit there for a minute. This is my last slide. It is my firm conviction that the great universities of the 21st century will be judged by their ability to help solve our most urgent social problems. Climate change and climate change disinformation are urgent social problems. They're not envir necessarily environmental problems. They cause environmental problems. But it's a social problem, and part of our society is built on education through the university. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Janet Swim. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to be talking about psychology and climate change denial, and I'm going to be talking about it in terms of the public's view about climate change, and what do we know about what the public, public thinks about uh, climate change. And I'm going to talk about it in terms of the psychological approach to denial. So denial is something that we've talked about a lot in psychology. It's something that even Freud years and years ago talked about in terms of um, like repression and projection of different sorts of beliefs. So denial has been something that's been talked about a lot in psychology. And denial is something that we all do. And um, where's my husband? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we were talking at dinner today trying to figure out what sort of examples about denial can we talk about. And so. Uh, Pick, pick one. I'll just pick one. <laughs> and we talk about cookies. So we've got lots of cookies in our house. My daughter loves to make cookies, and my son likes to eat them. And then we have cookies in our house, but my husband works at home, okay? So they come home from school, and the cookies are gone. <laughs> so where are the cookies? And he says, what cookies? <laughs> so he's completely denying the existence of the cookies. Well, if he, if he acknowledges that they were there, he says, oh, the dog ate them. Okay. And so he's providing an alternative explanation for why the cookies are missing. And those are two different ways of denying it. One is outright denial, and we might actually, is this is going to work? Uh, do I have to go over here? All right, I'm stuck. Nope. We call this, oops, we call this literal denial. The cookies aren't there. It's a literal denial. Or you can say, I'm an apple, I'm an apple, okay? So what I'm talking about are five different types of denial. And these are types that actually Norgard actually started talking about in the Netherlands. And so the first type of denial is, it's just not there. Okay. And this is a survey we did a couple of years ago on a, a national public opinion survey. And the question we asked, do you believe that there is solid evidence for the current existence of climate change? And what I want you to hear, see here is that it's yes. So about 80% of the people believe there's climate change. Okay. And that's an important thing to think about, that most people are not literally denying climate change. And this isn't new. This has been happening for at least 10 years that people say there is climate change. And that, if you dig a little deeper into this, you find out that they're not all certain of it. There's various, various degrees in which they think it's probably true, possibly true, probably not, possibly not, so you can divide it up farther. But overall, there really isn't literal denial of the existence of climate change, and that's an important thing to remember. Um, another sort of denial would be the de denial of the importance of climate change. So that is a difference between what a lot of people, what people be thinking about is being worried. So this is, um, be, um, time talked about this, be worried, be very worried about climate change. But the other part is, well, no, maybe we're not, we're just falling asleep. And in fact, this, when we look at, um, the, in that same study we did, if you ask people who, how much they're worried about climate change, they're not worried. Okay? So they think it's there, but they're not worried about climate change. 
so I should think about well, why wouldn't they be worried if we have climate change. Well, there's a number of different reasons, and I'm just going to talk about um, three of them. One of them has to do with our mental models of what climate change is. So when you think about climate change, most people think about things like melting icebergs, bergs, they think about polar bears, they think about storms, uh, and those are the sorts of things they think about, very physical things. They rarely think about things like asthma. They don't think about Lyme disease. They don't think about other sorts of human consequences to climate change. It's not part of the mental model. So when you're thinking about these sorts of effects that are occurring elsewhere, you're not particularly worried about them. So we don't have the mental model of climate change that way. Um, another is what's called the temporal bias. It's the tendency for people to be thinking about the here and now and not thinking about later. So um, it's a tendency, if you ask people, would you like $50 now, or would you like $100 in two months, they'll take the $50 now. So they have this temporal bias. And you can ask people in surveys what they think is the most important problem the United States faces, and they will say the economy. But if you ask them what is the most important problem that the world will face in the future, they will be more likely to say the environment and climate change than the economy. So if people are focusing on the now, they don't think about it. But if they focus on the broad spectrum of things, they do think about it. But the problem is we have this tendency to think about the now. <clears throat> Another one is what we call spatial bias. This is the tendency to think that things are worse somewhere else. So if you ask people in the United States, where's climate change going to be a problem? They'll say it's going to be more of a problem somewhere else, but not here. What's interesting to me is if you go to the Netherlands, when I think about the Netherlands, I think of them as somewhat of a poster child for climate change problems. If you look at those maps on the web that say, look at look what's going to happen over the years, there's not going to be the Netherlands. It's going to be underwater. But you ask them what's the like in climate change going to happen, it's going to be worse somewhere else, not here. In fact, Robert Gifford's gone across 16 different countries and asked people these things, and they all think climate change is going to be worse somewhere else, not in their country. So we have this sort of spatial bias in terms of where things are going to happen. We look outside of our window, it looks fine here, but that's not really what's going to happen. So we need to think about other sorts of things, and that's a reason why people are not particularly worried about climate change. Another type of denial is the denial of responsibility. So one part of that is the causal responsibility. And so surveys have been asking a lot about um, how much do humans cause climate change? And actually in that same data set they had before, most people believe that humans are causing it from our data set. And so there really isn't that denial of human cause climate change that the majority still think that. There are some <coughs> uncertainty again, but most people think that. What they're more likely to do is denial the personal responsibility for it. So, some responsibility. You made the mess, but you cleaned it up. So, so this is so people are denying this. Okay, you ask people, you ask people, do you feel guilty for your contribution to climate change? No, most people do not express any guilt for their contribution to climate change. But you can ask them a different question. Maybe you would say, well, of course, we're all individuals. And each person is just a little bit, so they don't necessarily feel so bad. So you ask in terms of what might be Collective Responsibility Act. And this would be like, this is a poster that came from Copenhagen with the United Nations, um, with all the, uh, all the discussions about climate change talks. And we might feel guilty for our country, not for ourselves. So that's something we've looked at. But no, people don't. People don't express guilt. They express a little bit more guilt for the country than themselves, but they don't. So this is more the sense of where the denial is. It's the denial of responsibility to do something, to act. And so why does that happen? So, so what do you know on the following two? So what you find is that most people are looking at everybody else. And we have a sense of what's called pluralistic ignorance. We don't think anybody else cares. We don't necessarily talk about it. And we're following the fact that nobody else is doing anything. So we have this pluralistic ignorance. And in fact, what happens is that people recognize that everybody else conforms, but they don't think that they conform. So it's a general phenomenon. So that's one reason. Another reason has to do with what's called a status quo bias. So status quo bias um, is, is an idea that people prefer to keep things the way they are. So we avoid action and we avoid change. So I'm going to give you an example of one study that was done a while ago. This is just a status quo bias example. 
So if you think about this question here. So you ask participants in a study, choose how, that, how a highway safety um, commission should divide its budget between improving auto safety, like seat belts, bumpers, um, and highway safety, um, guardrails, interchanges. Should they put 70% of the budget to auto safety and 30% to highway safety? Or should they put 30% to auto safety and 70% to highway safety? So if I asked this in the room, I thought what we'd find would be this. It's about even. People are as likely to pick one or the other. Now another condition in the study though, they add in another sentence. They don't bold it and put the colors in. But there's in this study, they say, currently 70% goes to auto safety and 30% to highway safety. Now you ask people to make a choice. And what you find is that they switch. So this, this other group, now they want what, what, what had previously existed, about two to one. Now they will pick the 70% because that's what it was before. Now to get a full design, you ask the same question, but you say, you tell another group of people and say it's 30%. And you ask them to switch and they will now pick the 30% one. So people change what it is that they endorse because there is a tendency to have a status quo bias, to keep things the way it is. And then there's also what's called system justification, is that once it's that way, you justify what it, the current situation is like. So that's a reason for a, a denial of responsibility and denial of to do anything, we're just going to keep things the way they are. So another type of denial is what's called interpretive denial. <laughs> So this is the idea that people don't deny the facts, but they just look at them differently. And when you say something to people, they don't hear it the way that you intended it to be heard. Okay? And so I'm going to give you a whole bunch of examples of what a group from the Frameworks Institute does. The Frameworks Institute looks at the way people respond to messages about climate change. And so what they do, for instance, is they look at um, the message is the oceans are in crisis. So you have people at aquariums telling other people that the oceans are in, in crisis. And you tell the public that, what they say is, what is it? <laughs> so another message you hear is that it's caused by greenhouse gases. And what people think, plants grow in greenhouses. How bad could that be? <laughs> um, you tell people it's caused by overconsumption, industry, appliances, power, plants, and cars. They say, progress takes a toll. It's inevitable. You can't go backwards. Okay? You say, we need to reduce our carbon footprint. They say, I live in the city. I can't grow my own food. And then you say, you can do something. And they say, I'll try not to litter and recycle more. So, so those are the sorts of responses to the sorts of messages that you give. And this is actually kind of an important thing, is if you're giving messages, what you need to do is you need to test how the public is actually responding to your messages. Because they may be thinking something that you don't think that they're thinking. That you intend them to hear something, and they're hearing something different. The last one is this cultural denial. So the cultural denial is outright coercion in setting the public agenda. And this is what I think Don nicely illustrated throughout the, his talk. And this is another sort of denial. It's the purposeful denial of climate change. And you have a whole set of organizations doing those things. But the consequence of that for the public is that that's not necessarily that they're all going on board of what they say, that, that the climate change is a hoax. There is a percent that do that. But the consequence is what you have is just a bunch of people going, I don't know what to think. So you have a whole bunch of uncertainty that comes from that. And that uncertainty leads to lack of action as well. And so when you ask in surveys, ask people, what is the, is there consensus among scientists about climate change? About 50, they'll say, about 50% of the people will say, no, there isn't. So the public doesn't believe that there is consensus. And this is something that in legal cases, people talk about in terms of battle of the experts. You bring a, one expert in, another expert comes in, and people just go, I don't know. Okay. Is butter good for me? I don't know. <laughs> you know is raw milk good for me? I don't know. So you have a whole bunch of things that just goes back and forth, and the consequence is not people going on board necessarily, but the consequence is just confusion. Okay. So when we look at all these things, what do we do? Okay. So, wait, wait, listen, we don't have to just be sheep, okay? So I don't want to just leave you with all these problems. I'm just going to frame these things again and talk about them in terms of how to have a response. So one of them is back to this literal denial. 
So messages shouldn't convey that most people do, people do not literally deny climate change. So we do, we are sheep, we do follow what other people do. We need to make sure that in our messages we tell people that most people think this. So that's an important thing to, to be conveying. Another is that for individual denial, we have to think about it in terms of highlighting the human impacts. So people need to become aware of those impacts. We need to think about current impacts. We need to think about what's happening now when people think about those things. We need to think about what's happening here in Pennsylvania. So Lyme disease, our trees are dying. We've got lots of bugs that are destroying all our trees here with the changes in climate change. We need to talk about those things locally and make them relevant to people. But in terms of making decisions, we also have to remind people to consider the future, to think about the future, because the default is not to think about the future. When you tell people to think about it, they're more likely to consider that in their decisions. But if you don't tell them, they just don't think about it. So you have to remind them of that. So in the denial of responsibility, we also need to convey to people that actually most people do think humans cause climate change. And that's a similar sort of thing. We need to be thinking about uh, getting people to take personal responsibility for the actions and things like that. So one way is actually to build empathy. What we need to do is have people start with something that they all agree about first, and then you build on that. And actually most people believe that we should care for the environment. That is, is a strong agreement. Um, it's also in a sense of a pretty strong agreement now of interdependence. And what I mean by interdependence is we are dependent upon nature, and nature, uh, we're influenced by nature, that we are all a part of this web of life. And most people believe that. And so if you can start with a message about those things that we agree on, and then move from those that point on. And in terms of the last one, this is, I don't actually know necessarily what to do about the, uh, all these groups, but it is important to convey that there is agreement. And so I actually agree in the sense that Penn State has all these people here who are studying it. We should have some sort of message that says, we agree. And there has to be some clear message about um, climate change scientists believe this. And because most of the public doesn't seem to understand that there is consensus that we need to be doing that. Thanks, Janet. Uh, hi, everyone. I kind of feel like Forrest Gump up here tonight uh, with such an esteemed group of colleagues uh, that I've been asked to join. So, uh, Pete and Don, thank you very much for asking me to join this panel. I'm going to kind of bring you down to about a 10-foot level now uh, after the, the last discussion and talk a, a bit about a class that I, I teach here at the university. And uh, actually, um, in 15 minutes, we'll walk you through a three-hour class and then about a, a two-week assignment. So I'm going to move. I'm going to move rapidly. So fasten your seatbelts. Um, just a, a little bit of background on me. I, I spent four years of my life studying the planet we live on and uh, got a BS in geology from the University of New Hampshire. Went back to school uh, later in life and got uh, an MS and PhD in, in environmental engineering. Environmental engineering is. Uh, uh, environmental engineers are the people that go out and clean up messes other people have made, sort of like Janet's dog there with the <laughs> hand, uh, and also try to prevent uh, future messes uh, from being made. So um, it sounded like a noble profession to me uh, when I, I began studying it, and, uh, and I, I haven't been disappointed um, since. Uh, since 1998, I've been here at, at Penn State University, and, and when I arrived, I began teaching a class in environmental engineering. And uh, life was simple back in these days. I could jump up on top of the desks and run around and demonstrate hydrodynamic dispersion. Uh, and also, I could teach chapter eight from my textbook on global atmospheric change, and I could talk about atmospheric chemistry, I could talk about climate forcings, and I could talk about global warming, and I didn't have anyone standing up in the back of the room telling me that I lie. Uh, it was a, a much simpler time back then uh, in 1998. Uh, in 2005, I became uh, director of Penn State's Engineering Leadership Development Program, and I began teaching this uh, course, uh, Leadership Principles. Um, and as part of that course, uh, we have several modules uh, that, that link together in concert. One on technical leadership, uh, followed by a module on judgment, followed by a module on the challenge of leading change. Um, to give you an example of the types of topics and speakers we have uh, for these modules, uh, this past semester, 
Uh, I had the director of the Carter Rock Naval Surface Warfare Center come in to talk about uh, technical leadership and leading with collective intelligence. And we pilot an online massive multiplayer uh, game called Mowgli. Uh, we pilot it in my class to deal with wicked problems that the Navy uh, and the world is faced with. Last year we dealt with Somali piracy. Uh, this year Mowgli is uh, tackling a scenario, uh, it's 2025, uh, the Navy, U.S. Navy needs to respond to a global crisis and they do not have sufficient liquid fuels. It's a, a, a scenario the Navy made up, not me. Um, the challenge of leading change, I had a, uh, a retired admiral uh, come in and talk to the class about uh, the uh, energy policy or lack thereof here in the United States. Uh, and there were ramifications uh, having to do with our national security for leading our lives like this without a, pol a fundamental policy on something as important as energy. Uh, in linking these two, I, uh, I've, uh, I've had an assignment uh, for the students on judgment. Um, the assignment I choose is usually uh, predicated on something uh, that I find from the National Intelligence Council, some uh, great challenge facing the United States. Um, what's afforded me a really great opportunity over the years has been climate change. Um, and this is uh, what I write on the assignment for the students. The current state of uh, climate change beliefs held by many in the United States affords an excellent vehicle by which to explore the judgment process. So that's, uh, that's the students' uh, assignment. Uh, now I know I'm, I'm probably gonna uh, uh, anger Janet now. I've put this slide up. I guess I, didn't, I don't say most Americans don't believe in climate change, but 50%, this is uh, from a Pew study, 32% um, believing there's no solid evidence that the Earth is warming, 18% uh, that the Earth is warming, but it has nothing to do with anything that uh, we're up to as, as human beings. In my uh, fundamental question to the students is uh, why? Why do these people believe that the earth is not warming or that it is warming and it has nothing to do with humans? There's got to be some sort of fundamental premise for their judgment, right? There's got to be something upon which they're basing this judgment. And my assignment to my students is to uncover this. So, uh, as part of the judgment process, generally the algorithm goes that we go out, we acquire information, then we establish the relative veracity or value of that information, we perform a quality control on it, we then uh, perform an analysis of the data, and based upon that analysis we formulate a judgment. Okay? So uh, that's what I task the students with. So they, uh, they begin uh, with things like this, uh, this seminal article by Svante Arrhenius, the Nobel laureate in 1896. Um, Arrhenius uh, wrote on the effects of carbon dioxide on uh, temperatures on the planet Earth. Uh, Arrhenius was actually a big fan of immediately uh, digging up more coal and burning as much coal as we could to change the climate. He was up in Sweden, and I think it was a cold winter. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, about 102 years later, there's uh, an article by uh, this rogue scientist up at, whoop, up, at uh, uh, up at University of Massachusetts, Michael Mann, uh, and uh, previous no. Let's see. Let's see if I can get back. There we go. Uh, by this rogue scientist, Michael Mann, up at uh, University of Massachusetts at the time. Uh, so they'll, they'll review uh, information uh, from the scientific literature, such as this seminal work here. They'll also review data from uh, the IPCC reports, uh, comparing uh, models. When we, uh, when we run the models with just natural forcings, uh, the, the models don't uh, correlate with what we're seeing in the environment, the actual temperature changes we're seeing in the environment. Uh, also, if we just look at anthropogenic forcings, uh, the models also don't agree. But when we combine anthropogenic forcings, the, the effects that you and I have uh, on the atmosphere of our planet with the natural effects, uh, we see that there's very good correlation with the models. Um, but because this is a leadership class in the College of Engineering, um, the students are also uh, asked to go and see what it is that leaders, people in leadership positions, say about global warming. 
Uh, so they, uh, they turn to uh, leaders in organizations. So the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, United States Geologic Survey. Uh, maybe they'll go to their professional association, the American Society of Civil Engineers. It's my professional association. The National Academy of Sciences. All of these organizations uh, are in concurrence. Global warming is occurring, and it's mostly due to, uh, due to the things that you and I are doing every day. Um, they'll move on, and they'll look at uh, leaders in our government. Here's a photograph of President jo uh, George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992, signing the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in Rio. And if it's a hoax, why is President George Herbert Walker Bush signing a climate convention uh, uh, signing something on a hoax in Rio back in 1992. And, and here's his, his son, uh, George uh, W. Bush, uh, in 2007, saying that energy security and climate change are two of the great challenges of our time. The United States takes these challenges seriously, and in fact, our guiding principle is clear. We must lead the world in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing global warming. Uh, George W. Bush. Uh, we can move on and we can look at Senator John McCain. We have many, many advantages in the fight against global warming, but time is not one of them. We need to deal with the central facts of rising temperatures, waters, endless troubles that global warming will cause, and we stand warned by serious, incredible scientists across the world. Senator John McCain, presidential candidate in 2008, and finally Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney recently, uh, I think it's important for us to reduce our emissions of pollutants and greenhouse gases. Uh, may well be significant cr cr contributors to the climate change and global warming that you're seeing. So there's really concurrence across the entire spectrum, the highest levels of Republican leadership. Uh, when we turn to our military uh, and our military leaders, we see that our military tell us that projected climate change poses a serious threat to America's national security, and these are not lightweights if you look at this list here. We've got admirals, generals, the last one on there is Gen General Anthony Tony Zinni, United States Marine Corps, former commander-in-chief of U.S. CENTCOM in the Persian Gulf. Um, we go on, let's take a look at what our uh, leaders in U.S. industry have to say about global warming. Uh, CEOs of General Electric, uh, BP, DuPont, Florida Power and Light, PG&E, CAD, Alcoa, etc. The science of global warming is clear. We know enough to act now. We must act now. And in fact, in our view, if we address climate change and we address it now, it will create more economic opportunities than it will create risks and liabilities. These are the CEOs of the nation's top corporations. In fact, if we turn to the business roundtable, right? This is an association of CEOs. Uh, of leading corporations, nearly six trillion in annual revenues, 13 million employees, including Chevron and General Motors, not normally companies you would associate uh, with uh, being on the bandwagon that you know, we need to do something about global warming. Uh, the Business Roundtable supports collective actions that will lead to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, stabilizing them at levels that will address the risks of climate change. Let's turn to our national intelligence community, the NIC. Right? These are the folks that, that uh, are housed with the CIA in Langley, Virginia. Climate change is expected, expected to exacerbate resource scarcities. A number of the reg regions of the world will be a particularly hard hit. North Africa, Middle East, uh, Southeast, uh, Southwest United States, especially with respect to water resources. So, uh, students perform this research and they say, well, uh, I don't get it. We've got all of our leadership at the highest levels of government, the presidential level, right? There's consensus among all the Republicans at this level, among all the Democrats, right? Rare consensus these days in Washington. The one thing they agree on is global warming. Uh, there's consensus among our mil on the highest levels of our military community, intelligence community, CEOs, scientific community. So what is it then that global warming deniers, people that we know, family members of ours, what is it that they are basing their judgment upon? What is it that they're basing their judgment upon? So, we've got entertainers uh, like this guy uh, that hold people's, uh, hold people's attention. 
Uh, and you can see that from, uh, from Rush Limbaugh's perspective, perhaps it's personal. Al Gore is a, a, a big target for folks like Rush Limbaugh. So maybe it's personal, that no matter what Al Gore says, Al Gore could say the sun comes up in the morning and goes down at night, and Rush Limbaugh is going to say he's a liar. That's Al Gore, pandering, more of his liberal pander. Uh, maybe it's, it's just simply Rush's persona, right? I mean, he'll just, he's disagreeable with, it, with anything. Uh, or perhaps it's, it's profits. Right? It helps to sell, uh, sell advertisement on the show. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Uh, we've got religious leaders uh, on the evangelical Christian right. Uh, Jerry Falwell, who's not with us anymore, uh, clearly stay, stating that uh, climate change is a hoax uh, and that, in fact, it's all a big conspiracy to lead us to global governance. So perhaps there's an element of paranoia in there. Uh, but maybe some people are listening to him. Um, We've got, uh, and we've got the senator from the great state of Oklahoma, uh, Senator James Inhofe, uh, who said that, uh, that uh, catastrophic global warming is a hoax, and that's based on the work of the nation's top climate scientists. So good, let's take a look at the top climate scientists that he references uh, and that he's relying on. Um, these are the folks from the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine. Uh, this institute has eight faculty members, faculty members at this institute. Two of them on their website are dead. <laughs> so there are six faculty members at the website, and then if you look, two of them are sons of the founder. So 50% of the faculty are related. <laughs> so it sounds like nepotism to me. Um, so uh, there are no classrooms or students at this institute, uh, and, uh, and this article that was authored uh, was authored by the head of the institute, his son, and one uh, external author. The institute also authors books such as Nuclear War Survival Skills. Um, the students don't get too hung up on that though, the number of faculty and things like that. First question they ask is, Dr. Schumann, what, why is there an article on global warming in a journal on American phys physicians and scientists? You know, I mean, we wouldn't go to the, the, the you know, the, the, the Meteorological Society of America to learn how to, to you know, take an appendix out. Uh, so what, why is it that American physicians and surgeons are, uh, are publishing on climate change? And, and that's a very good question. Um, the article in there uh, is a review of research literature. They say uh, that they, they conclude there'll be no deleterious effects from climate change. Uh, in, in fact, we'll experience increased plant growth uh, and all the predictions uh, that are out there are an error. In addition, other articles, if you look through this journal, claim that uh, abortion causes breast cancer, and in fact, HIV does not uh, cause AIDS. Uh, so, you know, what conclusion can the students arrive at, except that this is a, this is really not a viable journal, right? It's a journal in, in, in name only. So, uh, every semester I, I run this uh, class, the students arrive at the same uh, conclusions. There is a scientific consensus, and in fact, I offer any team who can find me one peer-reviewed journal article from a reputable journal that says either that the Earth isn't warming or that it's warming and it has nothing to do with humans, I'll buy the whole team dinner at Cozy Time. So, uh, they find there's a scientific consensus, I don't buy them dinner, uh, they find consensus at the highest levels of government and industry, they find consensus at the highest levels of our military and intelligence communities, they find that the basis for denial is flawed, and in fact, uh, it often has uh, extremist roots. So, in 2011, a, a collegiate article was written on this class assignment, and um, uh, the author mangled, mangled the intent of the assignment probably about 180 degrees. Not bad for a newspaper reporters. I hope there are none in the audience tonight. Uh, Pete wound up, wound up picking this story up and then recalibrated it and straightened it out and put it on uh, Sustainability Now Radio um, with the title, Going After the Ostriches. And uh, what was the response? Fan mail from uh, parents happy that I'm uh, educating their students, and from alumni saying good going, great job. I got an email from this guy, uh, Herb Stevens. Herb's known as the skiing weatherman. He's a, a Penn State grad, uh, immediately after graduation became a caddy uh, on the PGA Tour for five years. And, uh, and then after a, cu a couple of one-year jobs, became the skiing weatherman. Um, Herb, uh, 
Herb has gone on Denier blog spots and said, I've spent a lot of time in the last 10 years uh, researching this matter and global warming is the greatest hoax perpetrated on mankind. Um, he also tried to get uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Mann, fired um, back in 2009, started a letter writing campaign to President Spanier saying, in my opinion, Dr. Mann should be relieved of his duties based solely on the deceptive methods used in the creation of the hockey stick. I don't know what the hockey stick has to do with any of this, but uh, that's, a, that's a joke. Um, so I got, this, uh, I got this email from Herb Stevens, and I, I thought, oh, this, this should be nice, a letter from an alumnus. Uh, and I think Herb was especially ticked off at uh, the findings of this one group, Matt Steiner et al., that's my student group. So he had read this assignment that the students had turned in, and uh, in there, the students supported Michael Mann's hockey stick graph, and uh, also said that Fox News, which had reported that, in fact, the planet was cooling dangerously, uh, that Fox News was fallacious. Um, and Herb really took that personally, I think. I think he really <laughs> hates Michael and he loves Fox News. Uh, so he wrote me an email to tell me that it's obvious that my knowledge of how the atmosphere works and has worked in the past is greatly limited. Told me that I'd better stick with geology and engineering. And I thought, well, I'm, that's, uh, I'm not, that's given me a lot of degrees of freedom to work with. Um, told me that I'm clearly politically motivated, and I, was, uh, I thought to myself, wow, you know, I, I must be, in order to be in tune with Herb, I wonder how far right of Republican I need to be, since I've just uh, shown that we've got all of our Republican leadership. Uh, that's, that supports the, the, this, uh, that global warming is happening and it's, it's primarily anthropogenic. And finally, uh, he told me that um, the conclusions, as the one quoted above, are an embarrassment to uh, Penn State University. That made me very sad. Um, uh, between that and um, my obvious lack of knowledge based upon a quote in a student paper, usually someone, usually folks have to talk to me for five or ten minutes before they discern that I have an obvious lack of knowledge. Um, and Herb was able to do that just by reading a paragraph from uh, what students had written in my class. It was pretty remarkable. Um, so, uh, but beyond that, I actually got, uh, got responses for, from some of these faceless climate change deniers. Uh, Tom Nelson, and it's, you know, we don't know who these people are. There's, there's nothing linking these personas, these online personas with human beings. Uh, Tom Nelson wrote this article, Rick Schumann at Michael Mann's Penn State. Uh, it's got a ring to it, Michael. Uh, another professor promoting the global warming hoax. Uh, and this fellow, Andrew, Andrew is really remarkable. He runs populartechnology.net. Andrew wrote this scathing rebuttal to one of my students' papers. Uh, so this paper is on their the personal web, Penn State website. He wrote a rebuttal, uh, and it's, it's on all sorts of climate denier uh, blog sites. Um, his primary problem was that the students had failed to demonstrate that the Journal of American Physicians and Surgeons, you remember those are the people that say you get uh, breast cancer from abortions and, and, a, and HIV doesn't lead to AIDS, uh, he really, that was his big thing. That, 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 that's a, a quality, quality peer reviewed journal, uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, and finally, he said that, look, uh, that if I accept the false claims made in my student's paper, that I should be liable for an ethics violation. Um, yeah, so it's, I mean, there's a lot of funniness in here, but there's also a lot of seriousness in that there's a lot of people that are going on these websites and that are buying, buying this nonsense. Um, I think what's interesting to me um, is I think the tide may be changing, and here's why I think so. Andrew has recently um, modified his website where he's got all these papers that he said were evidence uh, against anthropogenic global warming. Well, he's changed that now. And he's added the word alarm. So the list is uh, peer-reviewed papers supporting skepticism of man-made global warming alarm. And then he goes on to define AGW, anthropogenic global warming alarm, is, and this is Andrew's definition. We have no idea who Andrew is. Uh, it's concern relating to a negative environmental or socioeconomic effect of anthropogenic global warming, usually exaggerated as catastrophic. And thus, clearly implying that all of the papers on Andrew's list, the 900, uh, they do not have to contradict anth anthropogenic, anthropogenic global warming. They just have to be alarmist in Andrew's mind. 
Um, and this is actually, uh, this, is, this is something of, of somewhat of a pattern. Uh, Samuel Settle from the Young Americans for Freedom, who uh, responded to the, um, the Collegian article, uh, wrote this in one of his responses. He said, the public is right to turn, turn away from climate alarmism. Well, there's that, there's that word again. And then finally, in, there's an op-ed in the, in, the, uh, in the Wall Street Journal from January, there's no compelling scientific argument for drastic action. There may be compelling argument for action, but not drastic action, you see. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, if you read the article, the scientists that wrote this, 16 scientists, say that uh, they don't say that global warming isn't happening or that humans aren't causing it. They just say it's going to be good for us. We're going to have tomatoes like they had in Jurassic Park. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Um, but mixed in, it's, it's remarkable. It's a, this, is a great, uh, this is a great story to visit. It's on the Wall Street Journal uh, website. You should check this out because there are so many snakes eating their tails in this article. When you watch the video, perhaps Professor Happer says, well, most people like me believe that industrial emissions will cause warming. Uh, just much less than what's been predicted. So it's an alarmism again. And, and while he's saying this, this banner that says the global warming hoax, is floating across the screen in front of him. So I, I, it made my head spin, and I pay a lot of attention to this stuff. So I think someone, a, a, you know, an honest person approaching this with an open mind, if they spent some time on this story and watching that video, uh, it would really um, maybe make them crazy. Uh, so I think I'm just gonna finish up with this. Uh, I think this is the new campaign. Hey, global warming, it'll be delightful. <laughs> Longer, longer growing seasons, bigger tomatoes. Uh, it'll be awesome. We can wear flip flops in January. Um, but uh, listen, at the end of the day, I want to just get back to Pete's, uh, uh, what Pete was talking about, and, and about the, the mission of uh, university and what we're doing here. And uh, I mean, first and foremost, it's to imbue in our students the skills uh, with which to look at the world understand what they see, and to formulate opinions on their own, and then to be able to express those opinions eloquently. But it's not to give them our opinions, it's to help them make their own opinions, and to, and to cut through the, the bull loney. Uh, that's <laughs> um, but also, you know, uh, Cardinal Newman has told us that, the, you know, the, the idea of a university should be aimed at um, raising the intellectual uh, tone of society in general. And, and I think that's what Pete's been talking about, and that's uh, what, what Don's been talking about, and Janet as well. And I think that's really uh, what we need to look at in the future here at Penn State. So, I'm going to try to go through this a little more quickly than I had originally uh, planned to. Um, as you probably gathered by now, if you didn't already know it, I have indeed been in the front lines of the uh, the public debate over human-caused climate change. Um, so I'm going to talk a, a bit about uh, my experiences um, as a reluctant and accidental figure in the public debate over human-caused climate change and what I think I've learned from those experiences and uh, what I think I can share uh, based on what I've learned. Uh, the point, the first point I'm going to make, and you know, this is really a reiteration of what we've already seen, uh, the scientific case um, for the reality of human-caused climate change is not that difficult to make. It's fairly straightforward. The greenhouse effect is not controversial science. It's physics and chemistry that's been known for nearly two centuries. Or scientists like uh, Joseph Fourier um, in the early 19th century understood that certain gases uh, in our atmosphere, like CO2, have this warming influence on the lower atmosphere and the surface of the Earth. Okay, so it's basic physics and chemistry. We know that we're increasing the greenhouse effect uh, through fossil fuel burning and other human activities. Uh, we've been measuring the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. We can actually uh, measure uh, the isotopes of the carbon in that CO2 and demonstrate that it's coming from fossil fuels. It's not coming from natural sources. So here we've got basic physics and chemistry. It's nearly two centuries old that tells us that if you increase greenhouse gas concentrations, you're going to warm the planet. <laughs> We've got a demonstrated increase in the concentrations of these gases. What would be truly amazing would be if the planet was warming up. And of course it is. It's warmed by about a degree Celsius so far, um, a degree and a half Fahrenheit over the past century. 
And if you don't believe those surface temperature records, if you're a, a critic, um, a denier, uh, which as we've seen already uh, today, um, uh, is, you know, has nothing to do with uh, denying the Holocaust, as uh, you know, some, uh, some, climate, uh, some of those who, um, who do deny the reality of climate change will accuse those of us who refer to them as deniers of making some reference to, uh, to Nazism. Uh, and of course, as we've seen, we're talking about a, 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 a psychological um, principle here of uh, denial. And if you deny the thermometer records, uh, there are literally dozens of other lines of evidence that tell us that the planet is warming and the climate is changing in precisely the way we expect it to as we increase these greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. None of this is based on climate models. Again, the critics will tell you, well, uh, all of this is based on these unreliable climate models. Well, it isn't. Um, it's based on uh, basic physics and chemistry uh, and basic measurements that I already talked about. We don't need climate models uh, to tell us that the planet ought to be warming, and it is warming in response to what we're doing. But we can use these models to project the details of climate change, to incorporate so-called feedback mechanisms, amplifying factors that will lead to more warming beyond what we would expect just from the greenhouse gas increases. Um, if we want to try to understand how rainfall patterns and drought patterns in, uh, you know, in the U.S. are likely to change as we continue to increase greenhouse gas concentrations, we can use these models and project them forward. Now I'd like to show this uh, picture here. <laughs> Many of you will recognize this uh, from the, the Seinfeld show, um, which uh, went on the air in 1991, but three years before the Seinfeld show went on the air, back in 1988, uh, James Hansen of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in the upper floors of this very building was running a climate model that was, in fact, uh, quite primitive by today's standards. And um, you know, Niels Bohr is, uh, is rumored to have once said that uh, predictions are hard, especially about the future. <laughs> what Hansen did was to make a prediction about the future. Okay, So that's what the past three decades of instrumental temperatures uh, showed at the time that he made those predictions uh, back in 1988. Um, and as you can see, the planet had already warmed uh, several tenths of a degree. Uh, he ran the, the climate model with three different initial conditions. Um, so there are different sort of sequences of random weather uh, in the different simulations. So they don't give exactly the same trajectory, but they more or less capture the warming that had been observed thus far. And then he said, well, let's consider three different possible scenarios of future fossil fuel burning. Uh, a low scenario, a medium scenario, and a high scenario. And it turns out that the scenario we chose, we ch uh, chose to follow was more or less that medium scenario. We, of course, uh, could have made different uh, decisions about our future fossil fuel burning uh, uh, behavior. And we chose the scenario that most closely corresponds to that blue curve there. And what did the observations over the subsequent two decades show? They showed more or less the warming that had been predicted. So I would say it's a pretty successful prediction, uh, two decades of warming. Uh, based on a model that was, by today's standards, quite primitive. And so when you hear the claim made that uh, these models have never been tested, they've never been validated, well, you know, there have been some pretty uh, impressive um, predictions that have been made with climate models uh, even decades ago uh, that were far less sophisticated than the ones we use today. Now, if you're a critic, you might point to that cooling, 1991, 92, 93, you might say, well, you know, if this model is so good, how come it couldn't predict something so obvious that happened, like this cooling, this three-year-long cooling, nearly half a degree? And it's true that Hansen didn't know in 1988 that in 1991, Mount Pinatubo would erupt and put large amounts of sulfate aerosol into the stratosphere, which would cool the planet by about a half a degree for several years. What he did know, however, was that it takes about six months for that volcanic aerosol cloud to spread around the globe. So he had some time to run his climate model again and predict the cooling that would be observed because of this eruption. And it turns out uh, his prediction was pretty much spot on. It was actually another successful prediction with, again, a climate model far uh, less sophisticated than the ones we use today. All right, so if you're a critic, you might say, well, okay, the planet is warming. Um, 
And yes, maybe you could explain that by increasing greenhouse gas concentrations from fossil fuel burning, but maybe it's natural factors like those volcanic eruptions that I just talked about. If they're changing over time and their frequency and magnitude, well, that could lead to changes in the temperature of the globe. Uh, maybe the sun is fluctuating. Um, in fact, we can measure it with um, satellites, and we do know that there are fluctuations in the output of the sun, how bright the sun is. And maybe those natural factors can explain the warming. Well, in fact, I think Rick showed a, a different version of essentially the same result earlier. Um, if it was just those natural factors that were at work, then what the models tell us is the climate should have actually cooled in recent decades. So I'm going to actually take a slight issue with a statement that's been repeated, um, that has been repeated several times so far today. Um, we often say, and I think it's to some extent erroneous, we say, well, the you know, greenhouse gases, human activities can explain most of the warming. Technically speaking, greenhouse gases explain more than 100% of the warming because we're actually overcoming what should have been a natural cooling trend from natural factors. Um, and so it's important to keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. We've actually uh, warmed in the face of what should have been a natural cooling trend. Okay. So, and if you add the greenhouse gases and also the effect of uh, pollutants uh, from uh, sulfate particles from industrialization, the same sulfate particles that caused acid rain. And of course, we passed legislation, the Clean Air Acts in the 1970s, 1980s, to clean that up. Um, when you put those two factors together, you more or less uh, reproduce uh, the warming that's been seen. Okay, and the future, well, of course, to some extent, we hold the future in our own hands. Uh, we could limit greenhouse gas <laughs> emissions, uh, try to bring them to a peak very quickly, ramp them down dramatically over the decades ahead and easily avoid two degrees C Celsius, um, two degrees Celsius warming of the globe relative to pre-industrial time, a threshold that's sometimes defined as a, the threshold of dangerous impacts on the climate. But if we continue with business as usual, uh, it's the red curve right there, um, then we will uh, in all likelihood warm the planet between four and five degrees Celsius relative to pre-industrial times. Um, that's you know, seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit, twice that much warming in the Arctic, by the way. And in that scenario, as James Hansen, who I mentioned earlier, has put it, uh, we would be leaving our children and grandchildren a different planet. It wouldn't be the planet that we grew up on. So, all right, now we get to sort of the second part of the talk. If the problem is this obvious, if the science is this clear, if the threat is this obvious, why haven't we done anything about it? And you know, several of the other panel uh, members have already more or less answered that question. There has been a massive disinformation campaign um, aimed at convincing the public that um, the science, if not a hoax, is at least fundamentally overblown. It's an overblown problem. It's bad science. Um, in, in a memo that was leaked by a Republican pollster, Frank Lutz, back in 2002, uh, sort of the agenda of the climate change denial lobby was really betrayed in that memo. What it said, this was Luntz advising his clients, who were essentially the fossil fuel industry, um, that there was still a window of opportunity left, that the public was beginning to become convinced that climate change, human-caused climate change, was real. Um, and if they were to become convinced, they would demand that action be taken, that there was still a narrow window of opportunity left to manufacture doubt, controversy, to convince the public that there is no agreement within the scientific community. As long as they believe it's 50-50, as long as they believe that the scientific community is not in agreement, um, they will not demand action. Uh, or they will at least be amenable to arguments that, uh, um, that the potential uh, threats to the economy could outweigh any damages of climate change, when in fact, um, as has already been alluded to here, uh, the, 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 the threat of inaction is far greater in all likelihood than any threat to the economy of actually taking action. So there are books like uh, uh, Climate Cover-Up by James Hogan, Emergence of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, which was mentioned earlier, that sort of outline this decades-long strategy to undermine the science of climate change. And in fact, they relate it to decades older uh, campaigns to deny things like the health impacts of tobacco products. Um, there's a long history 
of uh, efforts by uh, special interests to manufacture campaigns to call into question the science that demonstrates the potential threat of their product. In the case of tobacco, it was the potential threat of their product uh, to uh, human health, to human beings. In the case of uh, the campaign to deny climate change, it's the potential threat of the product of the fossil fuel industry, the uh, burning of fossil fuels, to the threat of the planet. It's arguably an even uh, greater uh, threat, greater consequences. So, you know, we have figures like James Inhofe, who was mentioned earlier, um, there, you know, it's not surprising that given that this has been the strategy um, uh, uh, taken by the fossil fuel industry and those politicians essentially doing their bidding to claim, for example, that climate change is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated by the American people. And my friend uh, Naomi Oreskes um, uh, likes to, uh, to joke that, um, you know, when it comes to scientists, you know, we should be so organized. <laughs> you get three of us in a room, you would find it very difficult to get us to agree on just about anything. And, uh, and so the idea that thousands of scientists around the world uh, could you know, engage in this elaborate hoax and get the ice sheets and sea level and global temperatures to play along is really pretty remarkable. So how did I get involved? might well ask, um, and uh, we already know the answer to the question to this curve that we generated more than uh, 10 years ago um, that uh, demonstrated that recent warming uh, appears to be unprecedented in a time frame of at least the past thousand years. It came to be known as the hockey stick curve, and it was featured in the summary for policymakers of the uh, 2001 IPCC report. Um, that uh, helped launch it sort of onto the world stage and it became an icon in the climate change debate. And as happens to icons in the climate change debate, uh, they get attacked. And so in the more than 10 years since we first published that work, we've continued uh, to be attacked um, in ways that I'll go on to describe. Um, and it doesn't matter that there's now a veritable hockey league, <laughs> that is to say more than a dozen uh, different reconstructions based on different methods, different data, that all come to the conclusion that the recent warming uh, is, it does appear to be unprecedented in a very long time frame, probably more than the past thousand years. And it doesn't matter that you could get rid of all these hockey sticks, the whole hockey league, and it wouldn't really make much of a difference in terms of the case for human-caused climate change. I mean, I made the case for human-caused climate change in the first few minutes of this presentation that had nothing to do with uh, my work or any paleo climate reconstruction whatsoever. But because it did become an icon in the climate change debate, and I think it told a simple picture. It, it, it was a simple picture that told a simple story. Uh, you didn't need to understand the physics of how a climate model works to understand what that curve was telling you, that there was something unusual about the changes that were taking place today, and by inference, you know, we probably have something to do with it. So, um, you know, Many uh, sort of uh, describe the phenomenon, the way our science has been politicized and attacked um, by vested interests and politicians representing those interests as the politicization of the science, but I'd like to use a different term, um, the scientization of politics, which is to say it's even something more now. Um, science is now being used as a political football. Um, in, uh, it's being used to wage politics in a way that we've never seen before, in, in my view. Uh, it's of a level of a magnitude that we haven't seen before, where you know, the two sides in the debate, well, there's the side of science, and then there's the other side, which manufactures their own science. They manufacture their own facts. And it almost doesn't matter anymore which facts are real facts and which facts are fake facts. This has already been alluded to. You can find a whole cable network that is willing to throw <laughs> fake facts about climate change at you and arm you with those fake facts. So you can argue with your nephews, uh, you know, at Thanksgiving every year. Um, so, you know, I have been subject to those uh, political attacks. Uh, just months before I came here to Penn State University, summer of 2005, I got a letter. Actually, it was a subpoena um, from uh, Joe Barton the uh, Republican chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and uh, based on the fact that he had read a criticism uh, of our work in that, um, you know, in, in that paragon of, of climate science accuracy, the 
uh, editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. Um, he decided to use his authority as the chair of this um, uh, powerful committee to demand all of uh, the uh, all of my emails and, and personal correspondences from my entire uh, career, uh, essentially to go on an open-ended fishing expedition um, to try to discredit me and my uh, co-authors. And now this was. Uh, years before Barton truly became a household name with his uh, apology to BP that some of you may remember um, after they dumped a whole lot of oil in our Gulf of Mexico. But he did get quite a bit of attention at the time for this, you know, this action, this, um, this uh, you know, action that was seen by the scientific community uh, as a transparent effort to intimidate the scientists whose findings were inconvenient to the special interests that he represented. Uh, by the way, if I forgot to mention it, he was the largest recipient of uh, fossil fuel money in the entire U.S. House of Representatives. And so the AAAS, the American Geophysical Union, largest uh, uh, professional uh, organization in my field, um, the journal Nature, uh, really the scientific uh, groups, um, scientific uh, institutions, um, from around the world came out to denounce what they saw as uh, an effort to intimidate scientists. Um, and even his hometown uh, newspaper, the Houston Chronicle, uh, denounced his actions as a transparent effort to, get to, uh, you know, to, to try to intimidate scientists. You might not be surprised to learn that Democrats like Henry Waxman, who had led sort of the, um, the tax against the, uh, the tobacco industry, back in the uh, 1980s, 1990s, um, would come to our defense. But I think you might be surprised to learn that perhaps the greatest hero in our own story was a Republican, uh, Sherwood Bullard. He was the chair of the House Science Committee. And it was really the fact that this was a time when Republicans controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency. So there was essentially nothing to stop Joe Barton from enforcing the subpoena, um, except the fact that a member of his own party, uh, Sherwood Bullard, an old school pro-science, pro-environment, um, Northeastern Republican, stood up to Barton and called him out uh, essentially for modern day McCarthyism and denounced these actions by his fellow Republican. And soon thereafter, another prominent Republican you'll recognize also came out to defend us against these uh, partisan attacks. Now, <laughs> I haven't even said anything yet. <laughs> so the next sort of, uh, the next uh, phase of the, of the assault, uh, of the battle, of the war against climate science was in uh, the weeks leading up to the Copenhagen summit, uh, the 2009, December 2009 Copenhagen summit, which was arguably the first opportunity in years that had come along to make meaningful progress on the issue of human-caused climate change. Um, in the weeks leading up to that, um, we, uh, the climate science community was subject to a criminal uh, hacking of a server in the UK. Uh, they stole thousands of emails from scientists, climate scientists from around the world, and uh, selectively uh, leaked them, uh, took them out of context, actually strung together unrelated words and phrases to try to make it sound like uh, climate science was indeed the elaborate hoax that James Inhofe had claimed it to be. Um, and I'm sure it was coincidental that it happened in the weeks leading up to the Copenhagen summit and effectively derailed any meaningful uh, discussion about uh, climate change for the months, in fact, years ahead to some extent. Um, and at the time, Sarah Palin wrote an editorial an op-ed in the Washington Post um, uh, talking about how these stolen emails demonstrated that climate change was a hoax. And she talked about how climate experts deliberately just uh, manipulate data to hide the decline in global temperatures, which was a fascinating claim because she was talking about an email that had been written, um, not recently, but uh, back in early 1999, on the heels of the warmest year that had ever been seen, 1998 boosted by a big El Nino event, and it was by far the warmest year we had ever seen. So climate scientists couldn't have been talking about a decline in global temperatures at that time. If anything, there appeared to be an acceleration in the warming. 
Um, and instead, what the scientists were talking about were some bad tree ring data uh, that they didn't want to show in a figure they were uh, preparing for a, a report um, uh, of the World Meteorological Organization. It was a cover figure that was supposed to be sort of understandable to a lay audience. And they were showing three different estimates of past temperatures. And one of them were based on a certain type of tree ring data that were known to be bad after the 1960s. It turns out that uh, they no longer tracked temperatures after the 1960s. And there are various theories for why that was the case. But this problem, which was known as the divergence problem, was actually the subject of the original paper in 1998 that presented that data set. So this was hardly a hidden problem. Um, it was well known that those were bad data. Okay, so anyways, that's a technical detail. Um, the Washington Post allowed me to write an op-ed in response uh, a little over a week later, where, uh, among other things, I pointed out what I just explained to you. Um, and in fact, it appeared to have an impact on uh, Sarah Palin, because she said just last summer, in fact, that a lot of those emails obviously weren't meant for public consumption. And she said that uh, they could be misinterpreted if taken out of context. <laughs> she was talking about her own emails that <laughs> like in the movie The Manchurian Candidate. Uh, but he was able to find 17 climate scientists who should be prosecuting, prosecuted for perpetrating the fraud of human-caused climate change, as revealed by these stolen emails. And I'm proud to uh, say that I was one of those 17 scientists. <laughs> and as some of you may know, um, it didn't stop there. The following uh, spring, the Attorney General of Virginia, um, taking a page right out of the Joe Barton playbook, um, attempted to use his authority as the Attorney General using uh, essentially a subpoena available to the Attorney General to ferret out state fraud um, to, oh, I'm sorry, it's the Ron Cuccinelli scandal there. <laughs> um, it, to uh, demand all of my emails and all my correspondences and documents from the time that I was at the University of Virginia, the five, uh, the six years I've been at the University of Virginia, uh, his actions were quickly denounced by groups of scientists, both in the state of uh, Virginia, um, the, the academic organizations like uh, AAUP, uh, even conservative academic freedom organizations like uh, FIRE uh, came out and denounced uh, Cuccinelli's uh, attacks against us. Uh, a petition of 800 uh, scientists from the state of Virginia, AAAS, National Center for Atmospheric Research and Journal Nature all once again came out uh, to defend uh, science uh, when it was under attack in this way. And even editorial <laughs> boards that had um, supported Mr. Cuccinelli's um, candidacy uh, came out and denounced uh, this as, a, as an overreach, as an abuse of power. Washington Post wrote five editorials denouncing Cuccinelli's witch hunt, as they called it. Uh, and even their award-winning uh, cartoonist, Tom Tolles, uh, couldn't resist uh, <laughs> commenting on the matter. It's Galileo there. <laughs> Cuccinelli. <laughs> and you, I'll be wanting to see your emails, too. <laughs> so, it turns out that um, the lower court um, found that um, somehow in his 40-page filing, he had forgotten to actually provide any evidence of any wrongdoing on our part. <laughs> it seems to have been a minor um, problem. And uh, he appealed it to the state Supreme Court, which just uh, two months ago uh, rejected um, the case with prejudice, meaning they don't want to see him coming back uh, to the beginning. <laughs> So that was a victory, a, at least a victory in one uh, uh, of these battles that we've been subjected to, that I have been subjected to, but more broadly, climate science has been subjected to the following fall uh, when Republicans were preparing to retake control of the House of Representatives. They promised that they would be holding a whole series of show trials once again, um, subjecting uh, climate scientists to attacks against their integrity um, and efforts to intimidate them. Um, 
fortunately, uh, once again, uh, Sherwood Bullitt, um, you know, pillar of uh, the Republican Party, uh, came out in an editorial and an op-ed in the Washington Post and warned his fellow Republicans that should they choose to go down that road, they would be in danger of establishing their party as the party of anti-science. Um, and maybe that had uh, some part um, in it, uh, I'll never know, but they didn't actually pursue that series of uh, witch uh, trials. Um, so, you know, to wrap it up, uh, it's a quote from Edmund Burke, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men, it should be good men and women, uh, do nothing. And fortunately, in our own um, battles with uh, the forces of climate change denial, good men and women haven't uh, done nothing. We've had, uh, again, uh, politicians of conscience from both sides of the political spectrum, uh, both uh, parties come forward to defend us and to defend uh, science when it was under attack. And that gives me some optimism for the future. Um, you know, obviously, there's no magic bullet. We know this is a complicated problem. Um, and uh, the point, uh, really, that I would make uh, here is that uh, we need to get past this bad faith debate we continue to have about whether the problem exists, the, uh, you know, the ostrich uh, bearing the heads bury their heads in the sands, and on to the, you know, the worthy debate that is to be had about what to do about the problem. And finally, let me uh, leave this on an intergenerational note, um, because um, to me, and one thing that I, uh, I try to convey when I talk about the impacts of climate change, to cut across that sort of, um, you know, that here and now versus future divide, um, that, to make it clear that, you know, this is, very much about our children and grandchildren. And I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, I have Democratic friends and Republican friends and they both care equally about the world that they leave their children and grandchildren. It's not a political partisan issue. And um, that's really what we're talking about here, making decisions today. Decisions today about our energy uh, choices that will have implications for decades and even centuries down the road making the right decisions today so that we don't leave our children and grandchildren a fundamentally uh, degraded planet. And there's still time to make the right decisions so that we avoid crossing those dangerous thresholds, but um, there isn't a whole lot of time. So it is an urgent uh, problem, and we don't have a lot of time to uh, waste if we're going to act in time to sort of prevent those uh, the most damaging potential impacts of future climate change. And so I'll leave it there. Thanks. heliocentric version of the universe, I was wondering whether his colleagues thanked him for his courage <laughs> or not. And they should have. But we're not going to wonder about you anymore, okay? So we have this picture of Galileo from your colleagues, and it says, in gratitude to Michael Mann, the Galileo of the 21st century. Thank you. This one is probably for everybody to take a quick shot at anyway. For real change within the university to occur, how do you address the views of extreme skeptics or those apart uh, from the disinformation campaign? Oh, those that are a part of the disinformation campaign. So at Penn State, what should Penn State be doing about this? Good. Well, uh, I am surprised how many college students that I meet and I teach climate science understand the basics of, 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 of climate science. Now the scientists may or an engineering student may, but most students don't know the things you've got to know to understand how serious a problem is. They don't know the magnitude of the reductions. They don't know that, that we need a 25 to 40 percent reduction in the next eight or nine years. Okay. So even college students don't understand, they don't understand that the United States has been the barrier for 30 to 25 years in the climate negotiations, and they don't have the skills to unpack some of the skeptics' arguments. They don't have, they're not being taught critical thinking skills about how science works, 
peer-reviewed science um, that morally and ethically, you, you, you should not have to wait until you prove anything. So I think higher education is actually failing, not only to educate civil society, but to educate students uh, for the most part about this amazing protection of civilization threatening problem. And so I think there should be a cross disciplinary attempt. No one should leave the university without understanding something about this problem. Not only the science, but, but the politics, economics, social science aspects of this problem. And some small liberal arts schools are doing that. Big universities are often not doing that. Uh, so I, I, think there's a, I think there's a failure, and we should call on the university to have a much more engaged effort to educate everybody about this problem. That, that's not good. Sure, I, I would just you know, underscore a point that Don, uh, Don made earlier, that uh, we have to uh, teach the distinction between uh, true skepticism and fake skepticism, and to provide the critical tools necessary to, to tell the difference. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, I, I, it sort of, for me, it often comes back to you know, the, the famous saying, uh, a quote from uh, Daniel P. Moynihan, former uh, New York senator, uh, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. And so we have to make that distinction very clear that, you know, sorry, you know, in a university community, uh, there are facts when it comes to science, and when it comes to uh, matters uh, like climate change. You can't have your own facts. You can have your own opinions. Um, and I think it's incredibly important to teach the distinction because I think, to me, uh, often when you encounter what you might think is skepticism about the science, and you dig a little deeper, you learn, in my experience, that often it isn't actually about the science. It's coming much more from ideology, uh, from uh, politics. Um, and if you can sort of get past that, <laughs> Then and recognize where where the denial is coming from. You can make you can potentially make some progress. And so that's what it's about. I I said a little bit in at the end of my talk too that I think that a university, a mega university like like Penn State, which if you had a a Fortune 1000 that included universities, Penn State would be in the middle of it. I mean, it is massive, multi-billion-dollar university. It's arguably the most powerful institution in the state of Pennsylvania, maybe more powerful than the state government because it can just tell the state government to go away all the time. Um, when you have a university that powerful, the statement that, you know, like what's in the ACU PCC that says climate change is real, we have people that tell us that it is real, and we have to take meaningful action, that pushes other institutions to do things, and it will push the political conversation some. If you have coalitions of every major uni research university in the country saying that and broadcasting it very clearly and then embedding it in everything they do, it will change the civil, it'll change the society. I would uh, add in a sense that support the idea of interdisciplinary work that when people are doing, um, people come to psychology and they, and they come approach me and they say, what does psychology have to do with climate change? <laughs> and so I think that's true in many disciplines, that people don't know that issues of climate change are relevant to many disciplines. And so that's true for the faculty members as well as the student in it. And so we need to be working on figuring out how to communicate that to all sorts of disciplines. Um, but I also think the university needs to be working on encouraging interdisciplinary teaching. We don't, I don't think we do that necessarily very well. And if we can do more of that, then we can get more of this cross fertilization across um, the students, across to the students. And then I, I guess I'll end on a really dismal note. <laughs> I, I, uh, I had a student in my class uh, who, after this exercise, came up to me and said, Dr. Schum, I'm so glad we went through this. You know, I was assigned in my business class up in Smeal. Um, my professor there, we spent a week where he assigned us to read uh, Wall Street Journal editorials and also to go uh, on YouTube and watch uh, talks and slideshows by Christopher Monkton. Uh, basically teaching us that global warming was a hoax. So in, in addition to being uh, proactive 
I think, uh, I think we, we may need to be a little bit reactive in that in this community, we need to understand, in this community of educators here at Penn State, I think we, we have, have folks that, uh, that are using the Wall Street Journal. Christopher Moncton is teaching materials, and that's, that's, that's pretty unacceptable. Uh, this, this follows up a little bit on, uh, on the university question. Someone asked, um, the reactionary right media machine, uh, sorry, the writing's a little tough, tough to read, um, quite effectively uh, aimed their deceptions at many slash mostly blue collar working class citizens. How has the climate scientist community made efforts to reach out to this block of the U.S. and maybe how can the university do that too? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess we, uh, Rick sort of, uh, you know, uh, talked about this and I sort of tried to get at this a little bit uh, too. Um, I think there are ways to uh, you know, to try to communicate that climate change isn't this sort Can of... speak up a little bit, Michael? Sure, yeah. The climate change isn't this crunchy granola, you know, issue that uh, some people uh, think it is. Uh, that, in fact, there are severe implications for national security. And if you care about national security, then you should care about climate change. Um, you know, the, for the first uh, time in history, in 2011, we had uh, 13 $1 billion or greater weather or climate related disasters. $1 billion, 13 disasters that cost more than that. So you might imagine the insurance industry is starting to get a little worried. And the reinsurance industry that insures the insurance industry is starting to get a little worried. And you know, these are not institutions from you know, the left part of our political spectrum. Um, so I think to the extent that we can try to depoliticize the issue and try to convey the fact that there are impacts across the spectrum regardless of uh, where you fall out in terms of your political ideology, I think there's potential uh, to, to get beyond that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we're, uh, our messengers have been, um, uh, been inappropriate for many in our country and our, the message has been uh, inappropriate as well. If you noticed in my talk tonight, I, I didn't uh, have Al Gore ones, uh, and and I think we need to maybe stop uh, stop quoting IPCC, which to some people sounds like uh, intergovernmental, sounds like black unmarked helicopters, and global <laughs> governance, and things like this, uh, and 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 start quoting Republican leadership, and start quoting military leadership, and start quoting in our intelligence community, because these are uh, these are symbols and these are sources of information. That a large percentage of, of our, uh, our 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 people here in the United States, our, our, our countrymen, uh, will listen to. Uh, and if you want to effectively communicate to that audience, um, then uh, then using someone like Al Gore, who I have nothing against, are using hippies and using the idea that if we immediately need to shut down all of our industry uh, and we all need to start growing vegetables in our backyard and you know our idea of governance is all wrong we need to reinvent de democracy in another form wow these are really this is a really bad way to package <laughs> this this information uh, could I jump in there because there's a, a follow-up question actually that was for Dr. Schumann that said um, can you tell us more about why the armed forces are concerned about climate change? And I guess that must be a, if you can't, if you tell us, will you have to kill us? <laughs> about why, other? why the armed forces are concerned about climate change? Well, the armed forces, yeah. So, um, and I have, uh, I've got colleagues in the Navy who, who talked to me about this. And I asked that, and they said, we're really concerned here in the Navy. And I, and I said, well, well why? Um, and they said, most of our real estate's at sea level. Uh, and it never dawned on me before, you know, the bases are at sea level. So, uh, so the, the Navy, uh, anybody is, is going to, to, to lose their real estate to, uh, to sea level change. Um, and but, they have to defend a new coastline, the, <coughs> new, the yeah. Arctic coastline. Yeah, yeah. but it, listen, it's, it's going to cause uh, tensions. And, and when, when we have tensions, when we have famine, when we have uh, unrest and we've got collapse of ecosystems, uh, are the, the men and women in our armed forces are, are going to be the ones who are unfortunately going to have to respond to those things. 
And, and especially in maybe in, in 40 years when uh, Bangladesh is underwater, or 100 years when Bangladesh is underwater, and we're losing island nations, and, and ecosystems are collapsing in the, in the Middle East, North Africa, and those people say, hey, who's responsible for this? And they look at the United States and the amount of carbon that we've added to the atmosphere. Um, they might have a reason to, may at that point really have a reason to, uh, to dislike us. And I just want to say there, there's the, uh, if, if you're interested, the, the military has the quadrant, their quadrennial review. Yeah. And so if you, you can find that online and uh, it's quite easy to read and, and I would encourage you to, to go check it out because it really is very high level uh, military saying, no, this is a huge problem. People, people being displaced is another issue as well. Pentagon's uh, quadrennial yeah. review. The Pentagon's yeah. quadrennial yeah. review, yeah. Can I go back to the other question? So I just want to take any turns. So I just want to make, it, make sure that sense of people understand that the demographics of the denial group, they may be targeting a blue collar group, but the de demographics of the denial group tend to be white men who actually are fairly well educated. And so it's, they may target that other group, but it's not their demographics. And, and I think the other thing, though, in terms of what, we're, what we can do to address it, is I think that we need to be working with more community organizations to reach out to people beyond even the student groups. And we do have faculty who are doing that, and, and Sylvia Neely is not here anymore, but she was an example of a faculty member who's done that. And actually we have three, well, I don't know if they're all faculty members, one faculty member is biking from today down, to well, left, left Friday, and going down to DC, and they're working with religious organizations, and they're stopping at churches along the way to talk about climate change. And so, we, so it's a way of working with a broader audience, and that's what they're doing right now. That's John Brock up. He's in uh, the history department. He's doing that with PA Interfaith Power and Light. Thank you. I'm not sure how uh, much longer we have, but a couple more questions. More questions. Uh, do you agree that support for climate change research and investment in alternative <coughs> energy would actually benefit the economy? That is, if we invested in these technologies with the potential that American science and technology has, that would give us an economic edge to patent alternative energy technologies. Why doesn't anyone mention this economic argument? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, you know, I think that this is this is something I often encounter. Um, you know, when uh, uh, you know, this argument, uh, the economic argument, once again, that uh, you know that. Uh, if we try to tackle this problem, it will destroy the economy when in fact um, just the opposite is true. The cost of inaction is likely to be far greater. Uh, but in terms of, um, again, it gets at this issue of cutting across the usual demographics that we talk to and reaching out to, to groups that might not be receptive to the Al Gore you know, approach to explaining the problem. Um, people who compare about uh, People who care about America's competitiveness in the global marketplace, um, you know, when they understand that you know, China is moving ahead with alternative energy, that the rest of the world uh, realizes that uh, alternative energy, non-carbon based energy, is the future of the global economy, and here they are moving ahead, um, and we are stuck in this, you know, in this fake debate about whether you know climate change is even real or whether you know electric vehicles explode or not. Um, you know, it's I think when they when you frame it as an issue of global competitiveness, I think that's a way again to reach out to people who might not ordinarily think that this is a problem that's going to affect them or that they should care about. If you want to see something really amazing, go to the Tea Party uh, website and look, I think it's about number 15 on their platform is to immediately invest in renewable energies. They said, we've been saying for 40 years that, all we, all that, that renewables are 10 years away. We need to stop this nonsense. We need to make renewables reality now. Uh, and the next point is that, and we shouldn't be investing in nuclear power because the wastes are too big of a problem and 24,000 years is way too long to have the plan. Really remarkable. Now they say a lot about the real. <laughs> say that when the economic arguments rise, and the economic arguments are important, you have to think about economic consequences, uh, I immediately see the failure to see the moral dimensions of this issue. Uh, this is a civilization challenging moral problem because it's rich people in one part of the world 
that are hurting poor people in other parts of the world. The poor people can't do anything to protect themselves. Uh, the rich people have not only economic interests, but they've got duties and responsibilities and obligations to other people. We must see this as a civilization challenge and moral, moral problem. And higher education, I think, is almost failing to teach them all dimensions of this issue. On top of the fact that the mainstream scientific view is that if we, if we have more than a two degree centigrade rise, we may create rapid uh, nonlinear responses which will really hurt the poor people uh, around the world. You can go to parts of the world and you can see huge human suffering in, in drought that is predicted to be drought. You can see it right now. When you see this, these people, it will tear your heart out to see how they die in a drought situation. It's, it's happening right now. The economic arguments somehow don't capture those issues. They don't get the moral dimensions of this problem. It's not simply a scientific question. It is, it is at its, its core, it's a civilization challenging moral and ethical issues, and the economic arguments actually hide and disguise those issues, mm -hmm. as, as, as I see it. Let me just uh, ask two sort of business-like ones before I go to, to um, so hard to pick the last one. There are several left. Um, someone asked if they could get the PowerPoints to share. I don't know if anybody is willing to do that, but oh, yeah. we can sure. post those. This, the video from this will be posted, and we can post the slides with that as well. Um, will that be and, the Center for Sustainability? Yeah, cfs.psu.edu. Um, and someone else asked if Professor Mann was willing to sign copies of your book. Uh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> okay, so um, this is maybe a little short term. If you want to take it to the longer term, this is fine. If nothing changes, if we continue business as usual, what projections can you make for the next five years, ten years? And if you want to go farther, that's fine. But th this, that was the question. I mean, for, on the time frame of five years, ten years, uh, fifteen years, you know, the, the climate is like a locomotive and it's got a lot of inertia, and we're actually not going to do very much one way or the other to influence what happens on that time frame. Uh, what we worry about is that locomotive eventually going too far down the tracks, and so we're committed to a certain amount of climate change. Um, it was implicit in one of the graphics that I showed, uh, probably at least another half a degree Celsius warming, a nearly a degree Fahrenheit warming of the globe, no matter what we do, uh, we do, even if we could freeze CO2 concentrations at their current level, just because of the inertia in the system. Um, but that one degree Fahrenheit won't take us beyond that two degree C, three and a half degree Fahrenheit threshold that I've been referring to, the three and a half degree Fahrenheit threshold of dangerous anthropogenic interference. And it's somewhat subjective, but that's the amount of warming where the projections tell us we really do start to see the worst impacts of climate change. So what it's really about is taking the necessary actions now to limit CO2 concentrations so that we don't go beyond that threshold. And our best estimate is that means limiting CO2 concentrations to about 450 parts per million in the atmosphere. Now, uh, a year ago they were about uh, 389. Um, it turns out that they went up to 392, increased by about 3 ppm um, over the past year. And so you can imagine if we keep on increasing by 3 ppm every year, we get to 450 pretty quickly. If you do the math, we're talking just a matter of a few decades. And so in order to stabilize CO2 concentrations below 450 ppm, we pretty much need to bring our emissions to a peak now and begin ramping them uh, down dramatically. So that's why when I sort of conveyed to people who asked about, you know, are, are we past that tipping point? Have we committed ourselves to truly dangerous impacts on the climate? Um, you know, the, 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 there's that problem where, uh, you know, despair can lead to denial. And I think if you feed this notion of despair, this idea that there's nothing we can do about the problem, it's uh, all too easy for people to bury their heads in the sands and just pretend uh, that there's nothing you know, to be done. Uh, but that isn't true. I mean, there is an urgency to the problem, uh, but we're not past that tipping point. We're not past that point of no return. It just uh, means we have to act very quickly. 
I, I want to say uh, three things, and I'll, I'll go from the, the doomy one to the happiest one. So I think that over the next 10 years, you're going to see things like this. I think, one, you're going to see, we're going to see more ticks in Pennsylvania. Um, you're going to have more people, including children, getting Lyme disease. You're going to see an escalation of probably the hemlock tree dying a little faster because the woolly adelgid is going to be able to hold on even better, right? So we're going to see species uh, come up that are pests that we don't want, and we're going to see the decline of others, and those are habitats and, and things like that. However, I think you're also going to see uh, a university like Penn State say, make a definitive statement on, on this issue, uh, if not in the next year or two, which I certainly hope they will, and I won't be around to annoy you all anymore uh, into doing it, uh, but I think that's going to happen, and in probably five years they'll be forced into doing it because the university would look bad in, the, in their peer institutions for not doing it. And then the third thing is, and this goes to something that I think Janet said about community outreach, and that's that I think that community organizations are are on the rise, and community organizations that may have at the bottom things like transition towns or you know uh, Spring Creek homesteading and State College, right? Things like that are going to have even more traction, and it's not just going to be everybody grow gar you know food in your own backyard, but that you're going to see real community action that will help at the community level ameliorate the problem. Although. I would say. And I'm the doomed guy. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> what people don't understand is about what the mainstream scientific view, it is true that we, we have to peak now, but people don't know that the science is saying to have any hope of stabilizing at 450 parts per million, the whole world must reduce between 25 and 40 percent by 2020. The scale of the challenge as articulated by the mainstream scientific institutions, is staggering in its importance. And on top of that, the United States would have to reduce far more than anybody else because you've got to give the poor countries a fair share of the carbon <coughs> emissions. What I'm saying is we need to turn up the volume greatly on this problem. The, 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 the degree of ignorance about its magnitude is staggering, I think. Uh, people don't know I was a negotiator at the United Nations. The United States has been the barrier in the negotiations for 20 years in the negotiations because of the disinformation campaign, largely. So I would say that business as usual is not okay, that we have, we have a duty to try to turn up the volume about this problem uh, in ways that far beyond the current understanding of the issue. So, Someone turn off the lights right now. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to turn up the volume. So. <laughs> I'm loud. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for um, all the information and your knowledge and, and sharing this with all of us.